Well, good morning. Special welcome to any visitors we have with us this morning. We are grateful to have you with us and to come worship our God together. We are in our newcomers class, and it's, it's been very rich to always see um, what God's doing and who He's bringing into the body and the beautiful different pieces, and I've just been very encouraged with this uh, group. Hearts for Christ, love His Word, they've all testified they've been loved in this body. <clears throat> um, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday as we begin now to prepare for Holy Week. This is such a rich time for the people of God. Uh, we're going to have a Good Friday service, as you've heard, and then a Resurrection Sunday service as normal. I think there's a, don't, just a reminder one more time, if you can get out and invite friends and family to come hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, we'll be looking in Acts chapter 13 for our resurrection service. Thursday night, I, I want us to gather, anyone who can come back to the church for our own upper room, or our upper room is going to be the fellowship hall. So if you can come meet me there, um, we're going to read John chapter 13 through 17. This is the upper room discourse, Jesus meeting with his apostles before he goes to the cross. What are the things that he wanted us to get and to be thinking about as the bride of Christ? So we're going to read through that and pray together. If anyone wants to break bread beforehand at six o'clock, we'll meet in there. We'll have dinner, but you got to bring your own dinner and drink. I'm not providing anything at all. So, but, but would love to have you, and we'll just fellowship together. So, encourage you uh, for that this Thursday. We're going to begin then to move. What is this special week? Well, I just want to read to you Matthew 20, 18 through 19. Jesus said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and we will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he's going to be raised up. And so we want to see this God who's in control as he's, as he's moving. The, the cross didn't catch him off guard. He's, this has been planned, predestined. It's why history existed. And Jesus now is saying, it's time. Matthew 20, 28. He said, just as the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I've come not to be served, but to serve, and I'm going to give my life for many to ransom them. So we begin Holy Week, and we're going to see that Jesus gave his life to ransom us, to ransom us from, from death. This death that he told his disciples about that was coming was the redemption price to free us from sin, the devil, death, law, condemnation. There's a price that must be paid. And Jesus says, I'm going to pay that price in your behalf. This ransom payment is the most important truth in the history of the world. It had to be paid for our purchase. It must be. And Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem and he says, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to make the payment that only a perfect son could make. It has to be one who's fully God and fully man and I have come for this purpose. With the resurrection being the proclamation by God the Father that the payment of Jesus Christ was sufficient for the release of our great debt that we owe to God for our sin. I could have tried to pay my own ransom price, and there are many who do. There might be some of you here this morning. The price is too high. We could have just went to hell forever and tried to pay it. And at the end of eternity, we'd be no closer to paying that debt than when we first began. You can't pay your own debt. So my prayer is I want everyone in this room to have stamped over your name, paid in full by Jesus Christ. That's what I want for this week. And for every heart to walk out of your prison cell of eternal death with a greater joy than when you paid off your college debt or your car or your house. How great this debt was that we owed to God. And it has been paid in full. And I ask that that would always take our breath away what Jesus Christ came to do for us. And what always grabs my heart is it wasn't paid with gold, jewels, or gemstones, but royal divine blood that was shed in our place on a cross was the payment. 
And so Jesus comes in Matthew 21. When they had approached Jerusalem and come to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples and he said, go into the village opposite you and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, Gentile, and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden, prophesied hundreds of years before. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. And he brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments on which Jesus sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, the humble king on his way to pay the ransom price so that we could go free. We're going to pray, but I want us to pray uh, as well for one of our own. We have a dear couple who've been going to church here for a few years, uh, Ethan and Elizabeth Gatchel. Um, They had a 19-year-old sister. It was Ethan's sister, and uh, she's been battling uh, deep depression, and they found out on Tuesday that she has passed. And so with all the pain and hurt, they uh, flew out to go be with family and to grieve together. And they looked at me, I'll never forget, in their house with all the questions and struggles and doubts, and they just said, I believe in a sovereign God, and I believe He works everything for good. And tears were running down their face why they had absolute faith and trust in their God. And so let's pray for this sweet couple. They they asked me to thank you. They don't have family here. And they said they have been loved by this body in an amazing way. They've had meals. They've had people sit with them and listen and weep with them. They had rides to airports. They've had help. They just just said, I can't thank you enough for the way this body has loved us. And so I tell you, my heart always jumps when this body loves the way it does. And that is how all men will know you're his disciples, that we have love for one another. So hallelujah. Let's pray for this dear couple as we prepare to worship. Father, we come before you and we lift up the gatchels. God, we thank you for them and what a blessing they've been to our hearts. God, I pray that you meet them and their whole family with the hole that has been blown into their hearts by the loss of their daughter and sister. God, I pray that you will help them as they grieve during this season. Fill them with the ability to grieve with hope, the hope of the resurrection, a hope in a God who always does right. God, be with them, help them, bless them. I pray now as we turn our attention to Holy Week, God, that you would meet every soul in this room this week. God, that our our focus would be set, that we would behold um, by faith the beauty of Jesus Christ. Let no one miss the visitation of Jesus. God, let everyone in this room have faith in this Christ. God, I pray this morning now as we open up the gospel of Jesus Christ, that every soul would be made glad in Christ that everyone would be believing in him and that we would be overcoming evil with good as we stare at Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Well, if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 12, we have been in this for a few months. Romans chapter 12, a long time has passed since we started the book of Romans, close to three and a half years We've been looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul says, I'm not ashamed of. It's the power of God to bring mankind into the realm of salvation. And I knew if we looked at it from every angle and kept staring at it, we would see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ, and we would be changed. And I'm just watching it in life after life. You're being changed. 
And I've been blessed by what the Lord has done. We have the joy and peace in believing. Last week, we finished up this chapter on the body of Christ, that the body of Christ shows mercy because of the mercy that we've received in this gospel. We show love because we have been first loved by God in Christ. And as we closed out our study, we, we moved in chapter 12, verse 14 to 21 on this idea of enemy love. We're different than the world. We, we love our enemies. We pray for those who persecute us. We forgive them. Uh, those who wrong us and uh, offend us. We live in a world right now that says, you shoot them, you get even. And we're seeing this beautiful ethic of the Christian life that we forgive and we pray and we love. And what I said at the close, I said, I promise that I'll take this verse up next week. And I want to open up verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then we'll go to the communion table as it's an excellent summary of the entire epistle of Romans. It's the power and motivation to this transformed life. Paul says, I'm writing to bring about the obedience of faith, and understanding this verse is what brings that about. <clears throat> so it is Paul in the season again. Are you guys ready? Okay, I'll hack all over you for the glory of God. So before this imperative in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Before that command, there were 11 chapters in Romans 1 through 11. You'll never be able to do an end around the gospel and just go live this way. You cannot live Romans 12, 14 through 21 in your own strength. The kind of love that this is calling for will never come out of flesh. It'll never come out of your own strength. You need the gospel of Romans 1 through 11 to set you free to this kind of love. Charles Bridge is one of my favorite commentators on Proverbs. He said, we are the disciples of him who died for his enemies. We're following Jesus Christ, who is the one who died for his enemies. That takes up a heart, and that's where this comes from. Those are the footsteps that we must walk in. So let's take this up this morning. We are to overcome evil with good. The instrument God has armed you with as you go into this evil world is good. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So my first question for you this morning is, is what is the evil? Paul, Paul didn't leave us in a lurch on this one, praise God. He, he, where, where did it come from? The, the whole start, three chapters of this book is where evil came from. God made Adam and he made him good. He looked out and said, everything is good. Paradise, excellent. He made him in his image, and Adam walked with God. They had fellowship. They were in agreement. They, everything was right when God and man are dwelling together. That was the beauty of creation. I love paradise. It's just green pastures to me, and it's where God's moving this world that is so broken. And that's my question. Did it stay this way? And the answer is no, or we would not be here this morning. Genesis 3, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? And so this serpent is crafty, and the tree they're not to eat from, he's deceiving and, and leading them into it. And we say, where did this crafty serpent come from? <clears throat> In Isaiah, we're told that Lucifer was the most beautiful angel, and he gets puffed up, and he wants to be God, and he's cast down from heaven with his cohorts that go with him. And, and on that plunge, we see it was pride that brought this angel down, who's now the devil and the sworn enemy of God. And that crafty one now comes into the garden, and he tempts Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden tree, because in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. And this the beautiful picture of paradise is instantly broken now by the crafty one. God and man are separated. And now God comes in the garden and Adam's hiding because of guilt and shame. They're not walking together anymore. And there's an angel in the garden with a sword that goes in every direction because no one is ever going to come back into the presence of God till this sword of justice is satisfied. The soul that sins must die. Adam and Eve, what a beautiful couple. They begin to fight. God, it's the woman you gave me that caused me to do this. And now all of creation is against man. He's going to work the ground and Eve's going to have pain and childbearing. Everything is broken 
from paradise. Paradise turned to chaos by sin. And what happens when creation moves away from its creator? This is where, where uh, my brain's not remembering his name, the guy that came up with evolution. Darwin. <laughs> Man doesn't evolve, he devolves. Okay? It's just been a devolving ever since. And God says this promise right afterwards in Genesis 3.15. The whole Bible's built on this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so there's going to be a seed that's going to come and undo what the devil just did. And, and you're going to crush this serpent's head. And John tells us that Jesus came into the world to undo the work of the devil. So what happened in that garden and all the destruction, there's going to be one who's going to come named Jesus from that seed, and he's going to fix everything that happened in that garden. And he's going to bring God and man back together. He's going to bring peace between man and man and man and creation. There's the promise of this whole world. And so that is where evil came from. And then Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 that the evil has been put to our account. Adam was our representative head. When he acted, we acted. It <clears throat> doesn't seem very fair, does it? But we, we learned that if you don't get his sin imputed to you, you can't get the gospel either, and I'll explain that in a second. But what Adam has done has been imputed to us. So every little cute baby that is now born is born in original sin and separated from God. We come in with the guilt of Adam as anyone who's born of seed. And that's why Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, Romans 5.12 said, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and then death spread through sin. And death spread to all men because all sinned. All sinned in Adam. We are spiritual stillborns because of Adam. We've been separated from our creator, the one that we were made for, the one whose image is stamped on every one of us. And the longer I pastor is everybody is broken because we've been made for God. His image is stamped and we can't find him. And we're looking for love in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces and we're running around. It's not working. The one who is forever broken because we will never work or function rightly until we're rightly uh, in, in relation to our Creator and our Father. And so this world is broken because what it was made for is God, and there's no way back into His presence by the sword and the imputed sin of Adam comes to all of us. And I wish it stopped there, but evil just keeps going. It keeps going. I want you to hear this. It's cancer. It's poison. It corrupts everything that it touches. And you know where it goes? It goes to my own heart. So Adam gives me this sin and separates me, and my own heart is corrupted and selfish. Everything about it is self-centered. So we are not just guilty from Adam's sin, but from our own. And Paul says you are by nature children of wrath. Our nature is selfish and we can't fix it. We can't change it in our own strength. We're broken. Paul said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are so broken that God is glorious and everything's about him. And now he means nothing and we suppress him and we live for ourselves and we make ourselves God and we defy him on a daily basis. We are so broken to value ourselves more than the glory of God. That's the state of humanity. And now, creation that proclaims God in Romans chapter 1, he said his invisible attributes are clearly seen. You, you look out into anything in creation and you know there's a creator. It says we suppress it. I don't, I don't want a God. I want my sin. And then he gives us a law that reveals his righteous nature and character, and we use it to beat other people and to excuse ourselves. We don't use it rightly to point us to Jesus. We use it as a ladder to climb to Jesus. That's our pride and our self-righteousness. You can't even give a law to humans without them using it wrongly and saying, I'm so good, I'll climb this ladder and I'll get back in the presence of God. That's how broken we are. That's what evil has done to us. It's made us 
evil from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. In Romans 3, Paul says it's your your will is messed up. Your affections are messed up. Your feet are quick quick to shed evil. Your tongues are slicing and dicing and they've got the venom of a viper. Everything about you is corrupted and now used for sin. Encouraging message. (laughs) Glad you got up. In Romans 3, 19 through 20, he says the law, no flesh will ever get justified. That law will never get you right with God. If you showed up this morning thinking, going to church, being a good person will get me right with God, it will lead you away from God. You can't get right with God by yourself. Evil is too deep, too pervasive. It can't be overcome with human. So we've been overcome by evil. It has overcome us. It has taken us. It has us. You bring the creator of the world into the world and you kill him. That's what's happened to us. The greatest evil. The devil, Adam, our own hearts. And and if that wasn't enough, now the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. That evil one is ruling the world. And we're surrounded by sin on every turn. You can't get away from it. It's in me. It's everywhere I go. Sin. I never cease to be amazed at the evil that I just hear on a daily basis. Walking into schools and shooting children. Laws and legislations to unrighteousness. Marriage is broken down. And worst of all, religion being used to puff us up and make us Pharisees. Jesus said the wrath of God is upon us. And in Romans 1.18, Paul said the wrath of God is upon us because of this evil that has overcome us. God is just to condemn us to hell forever then. There'd be no violation to himself if he were to just throw us all into hell for all of eternity. But there's another attribute in God, not just justice. There's an attribute called mercy. And that's why we sit here this morning. There's an attribute called grace and love. And they all have to work together. And this God has a desire to overcome evil in another way than just rightly throwing us into hell. It's the best news there ever is. This God has a desire to overcome evil in a, in a different way than just throwing us in hell. How? How does a holy and just God who can't have evil in his presence, he's got to punish it, and all there is is evil, how does he overcome it? How does he overcome my heart that resists him on every turn? How do you overcome that? How do you show mercy to a man who hates God like I did? And I want to declare to you this morning the greatest good that has ever been known to man. No other good will ever eclipse this. The rich young ruler, he said, there's none. Jesus said, there's none who are are good but God. All goodness comes and flows from the good one. And I want you to hear this morning how he overcame evil. And it it has taken up my heart. It's not mine anymore. My life is not my own anymore. It's been ransomed. And it's been taken up in the good that overcame evil. And so the best question in the world is how. Man cannot overcome his evil. We don't hold the key to fix this evil. I, I, I just pray and your bootstraps will break this morning and you'll quit pulling yourself up by them and trying to change your, you cannot fix this problem. And I want you to hear this. The legislators should be so tired that they can't legislate and fix this broken world. Teachers cannot overcome it. Educate them. They're educated sinners. Religions cannot overcome it. All their world religions have not fixed this. Technology cannot overcome it. Psychology cannot overcome it. The medical world can't. Philosophers cannot overcome it. How do we overcome evil? How can it be overcome? The world cannot fix it. And I want you to turn to Romans 3.21. And you know these are my two favorite words. I asked you to put them on your refrigerator. Uh, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of tattoos, but if you want one, you go put it on your shoulder. (laughs) It says, but now, and a cross on the other one. Tell your parents to come talk to me afterwards. 
<clears throat> Tattoos will not get you into heaven or hell. I just want you to know, okay? We're going to move to Romans 14, and I'm going to mess with you if you think it does, and if you think it makes you righteous, I'm going to get right in there. Okay, that's for free. He is just to condemn us to hell forever, again, with no violation. And now Romans 3.21, we're all just under evil. And all of a sudden, Romans 3.21 says, but now. And so the only remedy, the only answer is God doing and acting to save us. It's what he's done. And I just can't get over this. But now, God entered the world that he created to overcome the evil works of the devil. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has come to overcome evil with good. And this is the remedy, my dear friends. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. But as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. So I want you to come with me to Romans 3. And Jesus is going to enter this world and overcome all of my evil and yours with good. So look with me at the but now in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. There's another way that righteousness has been made known besides the law of Moses. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So there's another way it's being revealed, and the law and the prophets talked about this other kind of righteousness that would be revealed. And it says in verse 22, the God kind of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there's no distinction, Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how is this going to work? Being justified. So there, there, there's a way to be declared not guilty. There's a way to be right before God. And I'm going to go over that more in a second. But being justified, how do we get right with God? As a gift. It's a gift. And it's a gift by His grace, which means He does it all. So here's this package called salvation, and God's giving it to you. And when you open it up, it's everything that God has done for you, what? Through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. This package is Jesus came and paid the ransom price to set you free from your bondage of sin and death. So, hallelujah. And God displayed him publicly as a propitiation. He put him up on a cross and Jesus became the bullseye of God's wrath for every sin that I ever committed. What I would have had to go to hell and spend eternity paying, he paid it on that cross for three hours. He drained every last drop. And as I said in the garden, that cup was all the wrath. And when he was done, you could shake that cup and there's not one last drop for you, child of God. I want you to hear that, not one drop of condemnation left. The son drank it all. You could never drink another drop if you have come into Jesus Christ and believed. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So beautiful. And I, let me keep going. He was, it was in his blood through faith and catch this, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. This was to show that God was righteous because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed in the Old Testament. And so we, we looked at that and said, how did God, when David sinned against Bathsheba and his father, and David says, I'm sorry, and God says, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. What if you're Bathsheba's father? How do you feel about that? You're going to struggle, aren't you? And so there's, God's on trial because you've been passing over sins that were previously committed. Are you just? Are you a just God? And this cross was to demonstrate his righteousness, to show to the world, it matters that you defy my glory. It matters that you sin against me. I don't just wink and ignore it and wipe it away. It matters. And I put my son on a cross and I pierced him through because it matters. It matters that sin is punished and dealt with and treated for, for what it really is. 
That is such a violation to God. And he, so he, he showed that in verse 26 for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time that God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So now he can look at you and forgive you of your sins and be just because he was just to his own son on the cross. So he doesn't violate his being himself. He can forgive you of every sin that you've committed and not violate the justice that says the soul that sins must die. Only the wisdom of God could have come up with a plan like that. Let it, let it cause you to just believe, love, worship. What a gospel. So the things that needed to take place to overcome evil is I needed a legal justification that needed to be declared. <clears throat> My sin must be dealt with truly not just in a ledger. My sin and his wrath had to be fixed. And I want to bring you into that transaction between God the Father and God the Son. And the Son says, I will leave glory and become a man and live a perfect life so that I can die on a cross as a spotless lamb of God to be a sacrifice for the sins of your people, God. And the Father says, all my wrath for their sins are going to be poured out on you on that cross. Son, you will propitiate my anger and my fury and my wrath for sin. And the Son says, I'm willing. I will go. And that's the foundation stone of the good that overcame this evil. I drank the cup for all the evil and its punishment on the cross Sins had to be paid for. That sword of justice had to be satisfied. It had to be driven through an offender. And it was driven through the Son of God's own heart. He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. It pierced Jesus through for our transgressions. And so hear this, the way back into the garden, the presence of God can now be paved. I can walk right into to fellowship with God again like Adam had in the beginning of creation. I now can have this relationship with God. I have a relationship that was better than Adam's because Adam's could be broken by sin and mine can never be broken because the son cannot sin. I have the most secure relationship with God. Hell itself can't break it. Nothing can separate. Adam's sin could break it. I got, I got so much security, it's ridiculous. I, I got something better than Adam. And, and, and Jesus could never be tempted away from the Father. We saw it uh, in Matthew and all the temptations. You could never get Jesus to take his hand and his eye and his heart off the Father. It will never happen. And not to mention the crafty one and all his cohorts and everyone who's followed him are going to be thrown in the eternal abyss forever. So you can't even be tempted anymore. Good news? And now by Jesus' obedience and his righteousness, which can never fail, can keep me for all of eternity. I got back way more than what Adam lost because I have this picture of Jesus Christ who did all this for me for all of eternity. I, paradise is better when you have Jesus dying for your sin and loving you. Like, we have it all. And now come to Romans chapter 4. There's more to our justification. Come to chapter 4, verse 3. I don't want to get too lost in this. <clears throat> For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God that God would bless the nations through his seed and, and several other things. But he believed God and it was logizomide. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. So when he believed what God said he would do to save, uh, it's put to his account. You're righteous. And now Paul's application is to the one who is a, it's a participle, the one who's a working one. Anyone in here trying to work and be good enough to get God's favor, to get his wrath off of you, that one, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but what is due. You earned it, you deserved it. But here's the gospel. On the other hand, to the one who is not a working one, you finally quit trying to work to get God's favor and acceptance. You enter into his rest Quit being a working one. You quit doing that, but you believe in Jesus who justifies the ungodly. 
His faith is reckoned as righteousness. The one who believes this gospel, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to your account. So you sit here this morning looking like you live the life that Jesus lived, that he's happy with you. He's rejoicing in heaven over you. Like, I know I'm a rotten scoundrel, and he's smiling at me because I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and all my sins were put on him and paid for. I don't know what that could do for your heart this morning. So Paul labors hard for justification, for you to realize that, that it comes not by your works, but by faith, believing what God has done through Jesus Christ. And it's the most needed word in the church today is that when you believe this, you are declared righteous and just before God based on what Jesus did and not what you did. There's a way to be perfect, righteous before your God. That's overcoming evil with good. And this sets people free when they get this. I've watched it again and again when you finally realize that the Medal of Honor that Jesus had placed on him for winning the victory of loving God and loving others is now put on me as if I won the war, that I was the hero. I, I have Christ's righteousness put to my account. The most beautiful thing to overcoming evil is that it's a gift from God. And Paul labors hard in chapters three and four to show you that it's by faith and not by works. And I want you to hear that a hundred times over and over again. It's not by your works. It's by faith and believing this gospel that you are justified before God. And that truth started a whole reformation and changed the world, that it was by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so I pray, do you see this? Paul said, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That the law, you're done with it, trying to get righteousness through that. He's the end of it because we get full righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Is there, could there be a better message? To overcome evil is not by your strength, your working, your morality, you fixing yourself up. It's the best news you could hear. And everyone in this world tries to get it by fixing themselves up. And it's the opposite. That's not the gospel. It's by sitting here, again, with broken bootstraps because you've been trying to clean yourself up and pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you just keep trying and trying and trying. And it's looking to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation to be justified where God says you're not guilty. Not guilty. Have you seen this? Have you looked your eyes out with all of your sin and failures to self-improvement and fixing yourself and just looked at Jesus and believed? Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was pushing my little granddaughter. She was almost two in the swing. And I just said, Ella, do you know that Jesus Christ died for you and all your sins are forgiven? And she just goes, hallelujah, on the swing. <laughs> hallelujah, girlfriend. Everyone should throw their hands up. Hallelujah. You, you have peace with God. What a gift through Jesus Christ. God has not finished overcoming evil with good. There's more. There's more. God says that sin cannot have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but under grace. So now there, there's more to this gospel. By faith, you're joined to Jesus Christ. And so when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised, you were raised. When he was seated at the right hand of God, Paul says, you are seated there positionally right now. You are one with Jesus Christ. And he says, the dominion and rule and reign of sin when you were in Adam has been broken. And we spent a lot of time on this. It's reigning. It used to be reigning, but now it's remaining. It used to be president, now it's resident. Um, it, it's just been broken by the gospel. You are now joined to Jesus and you have a new relationship to sin. In Romans 7, we learn that uh, indwelling sin is still a powerful thing <laughs> and it still fights us and causes us to do some things that we don't want to do. And there's this battle in, in Romans 7 against sin 
And Paul crying out, who's going to set me free from this body of sin? And he, he rejoices that Jesus Christ is going to come and deliver us completely from sin. But he goes to chapter 8, and he says that by the Spirit now, we can begin to mortify the remaining sin that is still in our life. So here's God still overcoming evil. There's still evil that's lurking within me. And the Spirit of God, he says in Romans 8, 13, that that is, it's only by his Spirit that this sin can be put to death. Your own strength, your own hands, your own workings cannot kill sin. But the Holy Spirit, to, 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 it's to mortify, it means to weaken to starve. And so it, it, you can now starve sin by grace through faith. The Spirit is showing you this gospel, everything we just went over. And as you see it, you're, you're beginning to love Jesus more than the sins that are being presented to you. You're, he's becoming greater. And it's going to be this view of Jesus and the Spirit revealing and us believing the gospel that starts to mortify and starve and weaken and kill sin versus you going, I'm going to go take it down. And, and some of you are getting knocked on your keister every time you get up and you go fight it again in your own strength. It won't work. The Holy Spirit is the way to put to death the deeds of the flesh. So he's overcoming evil still lurking within our own hearts as children of God. And he does more. He does more than overcoming evil by the works of the devil. He says there's going to come a day when you are going to be glorified. In Romans 8.30, he said, those whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And our great joy when we studied that is that they're all past tense heiress. So all of these already happened. And, and we said, wait a minute, I'm not glorified. If I am, I got cheated. <laughs> this better not be glorification in this body. So glorification, it's as if it's already done because God has decreed it and nothing can stop it. Nothing can bring you short of him bringing you to glory. And he's going to bring you to glory. And as the hymn writer said, you're going to be saved to sin no more. He is going to perfectly overcome evil with good. And there'll be no more sin for the rest of eternity. No more evil. It's done with forever. A new heavens and a new earth where no sin dwells. It will never enter in again. And what will it be like for sin to just be a long past memory? <laughs> I can't wait. No more trials, no more temptations, no more worries. The work of the devil undone for all of eternity and used to put the glory of God on display for this marvelous gospel for all of eternity. The devil was a lackey. He was a junkyard dog tethered to the will of God, and all this evil was to put on display all of God's attributes, his grace and his mercy and his love that, that would have never been put on display with just the Trinity being happy for all of eternity. And so what a beautiful plan this redemption is to overcome evil with good. And the way that we overcome evil then is with good. The greatest good that has ever been known to man, we call it Good Friday. And this is how we overcome evil. This gospel produces the love of Romans 12. This just produces little buds all over our limbs and the gospel waters them and they bud. And I, spring, get ready. This, this is what we could be by the Holy Spirit and the gospel watering this in our lives. We love because he first loved us. We overcome all the evil that comes at us with good, with love and kindness like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul said, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, that remaining flesh, and now to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age, what do we do? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. So you got the, both advents causing us this. And he said, he gave himself for us. He paid the ransom that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. 
That goodness produces the goodness in us. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. We love others because we have been loved by God. So to God be the glory for overcoming evil with good. And let's dig in this week and just stare in the face of that good. And let's not just be religious. Let's look at this by faith of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And I just want us to treasure this together this week and just be amazed at what God has done in overcoming evil. So let's pray and we will go to the table. Father, we come before you and I thank you. I thank you for the good that overcame evil. I thank you for your plan and eternity past of such a glorious gospel. I thank you that it put all your attributes on display. It put your glory on display for such an amazing, saving God. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his willingness to come to this earth to be the sacrifice and to be our righteousness. God, I thank you and I pray um, that as we look at that this week and even at the table now and remember how this, this overcoming evil with good was purchased. This is the coming to the greatest evil that has ever been done on this earth, killing the Son of God, and it produced the greatest good, the salvation of sinners by his death in our place. God bless us now as we remember this beautiful thing. Amen.